Hey there, fellow citizens of the internet. Welcome to the Moses Kabandana podcast. Today I have a very, very special guest. And uh, well, why don't you introduce, uh, introduce yourself, Pat? Uh, hi, I'm Pat Wetzel. I, am the, uh, I have a podcast, Bump in the Road, and I'm the author of a book, Bump in the Road, 15 Stories of Courage, Hope, and Resilience. The book actually grew out of my podcast, um, and the podcast grew out of a bump in the road. <laughs> I was working on a film project. Uh, the idea was every quarter to give seven people impacted by cancer an amazing bucket list trip and tell their story against the backdrop of some of the world's most iconic locations. Our first stop was Tanzania, where we would look at Kilimanjaro and the metaphor of a mountain, safari and the metaphor of survival, Zanzibar and the spice of life. Well, all this was coming together very nicely when COVID hit and travel was shut down. So the entire project, two years of work and planning, fell apart. And um, my first response was simply to sit in bed and eat potato chips for two weeks. You know, the nice thick ridge ones with lots of salt. <laughs> and then I realized this is not a healthy coping mechanism. Right. So um, I decided to start a podcast partly to keep my social media uh groups in place. And I thought about it and I thought, bump in the road. I've had so many bumps in the road of life. I need to know how other people have weathered these bumps in the road. There has to be a lot of wisdom here. Mm -hmm. So I started, I didn't know anything about podcasting. I didn't know if I could get anybody on the show. I didn't know where it would go, but I dove in. And about a year and a half into it, I realized there was so much wisdom from my guests. I mean, just so much profound wisdom that I had to sh find another avenue of sharing it uh, because I am, I have the 30,000 foot view of my podcast. I talk to everybody mm -hmm. and I see all the common threads that come from all the conversations and those needed to be put together in a format that other people could benefit from. So that's how the book came to be. Wow. Okay. So, well, let's dive into the bumps in the road, right? Um, I, I, I like to everyone every like now and again at least like once a month the the, the phrase of there's no sh there, there's no shortage of misery in life enters my mind don't know why but it's just <laughs> the, there is something that keeps reminding me once a month or so that hey there's, there's no shortage of misery in life so so whatever my current circumstances are good bad neutral um that voice is always in the back of my mind reminding me to to um to express gratitude no matter you know the stage of life that i'm in um so so i say that because i'm assuming here that, that bumps in the road um can be replaced with miseries in the road more or less i suppose um so what why have you noticed being like having talked to so many other people you yourself having gone through ha having had so many bumps uh, in the road what is one of the biggest misconceptions that people have when they think about a potential calamity a potential misery a potential bump uh, in their road i think that when we all hit a bump that we are mired in the moment it seems like we'll never get out of it it's really hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And if you see it, it's probably an oncoming train. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that um, one of the things that fascinates me is how do we work our way through these bumps? And I think one of the key elements that absolutely everybody touches on is simply take action, one small step. And this can be very, very hard because you're just overwhelmed by current circumstances. And it may yeah. not happen overnight. These things take sometimes years to play out. But put energy into the situation. Energy will change everything. Energy will change. Can you, can you expand a little bit more what you mean by energy? Is it, is it your attitude? Is it, is it where you decide to focus? On, like, just let us in, into what, what you mean by energy. I think attitude is part of it, but that can be slow in coming. I, I think okay. gratitude, which you mentioned, is incredibly important. Um, and it can be hard to find things to be grateful for sometimes. But if you can just find three things every day, find three things to be grateful for. And it could be something as simple as a wonderful hot shower. It mm -hmm. might be, you know, that the sky is blue and it's gorgeous today. 
it, it, it can just be very small things. But I think developing that attitude of gratitude is mm. a really important habit in life in general, because we have we have choice in terms of how we see things. And that choice determines our mindset. It determines our actions. So what do you choose? And the, mm. that in turn goes to how do you become conscious enough to make to even see that you have choices? Right, right. Can you give us an example of one bump uh, in in the road uh, in your road, right? And and how? What are those? What are some of the three things that that you had to do that that led you to be grateful uh, within, like while still facing that bump? Um. One bump I went through was six years of on again, off again, treatment for lymphoma, cancer treatment, six years. That's a bump. Um, I think that for me, there were some really profound, positive things that came out of that whole experience. <clears throat> One was certainly gratitude oriented. I looked around at what the good things that were going on in my life. And a lot of them were nature-based, actually. You know, the hummingbird in the garden, the feel of the sun on your skin, the wind, you know, yeah. moving the hammock, that type of thing. So I, I think gratitude was part of it. But from that, for me, came a very deep, almost transcendent sense of joy. I found so much joy in so many small everyday things. And that's something, I mean, I've, I've had joy in my life before, particularly during my flying years, another story there. But um, I think joy was a really profound part of it. And I also, for me going through that, um, it really shifted the way I viewed the world because one of the things that happens through long-term illness is people fall away because they don't know what to do or say, and they have their own lives to live. So your entire social structure may restructure itself. People will not be there. Um, and that also gives you a lot of food for thought in terms of what is important to me? Where do I want to go? What does matter? Hmm. Well, let's, let's, let's pick that, that last uh, sentence there, I suppose. What, what does matter? So, so how, I forgot who, who said this, but it was like, um, if you have a strong enough why, you can bear almost any any how, uh, and and so I, I guess that kind of alludes to what does matter. Like what's what what's the important thing? Like what what's what is the why that you wake up in the morning? What's the why of of um, uh, seeing the other side, the, the light the light at the end of the of the tunnel? Um, so question that, that I have then he, here is is as you're going over that hump, right? Like when you look back at, at, at a time that, that, that you're going over the bump, it's, it's a little bit easier to, to, you've distanced yourself somewhat, right? That bump is still part of you, you know, but, but the attitude that you have post the bump versus while you're in the midst of it are, are, are quite different. Um, I want to talk more to like, for the person that is currently going through their bump, right? Uh, how, how how do you develop a, a strong enough why to to go through that bump right because because and this is not a trivial question i, I said it because some people and this is a bit, a bit more serious um they're going through such a bump that they they are arrive to the conclusion that it's not worth it and then yeah. they, they, they 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 right right they they end um and their journey you know so to speak so um while someone is going through the bump um how, where where do you find this energy to to say okay i will live to see tomorrow right I'll, I'll, I'll tomorrow might be better or maybe the day after might be better how, where do you cultivate this strong enough why to bear the current bump that you're going through that's would, a very complicated question but i just want to put it out there yeah no it's a great question um one thing i think is to nurture your curiosity let me tell you a story of maybe one of the biggest bumps i ever went through uh, and that for me was divorce. Uh, I mm. had some health issues. My ex decided he wanted to be elsewhere. And when he left, his family, who I'd been very close to for 15 years, said to me, well, if he's not happy, it's your fault. And boom, they were mm. out of my life. So my I was ill. My entire support network was absolutely gone. And not just gone, I was really kicked in the gut. And right. I didn't know everything that was going on. There were obviously 
there were love lies and things like that. In retrospect, I think I figured it out, but that's not part mm -hmm. of the story. What is part of the story is I was feeling incredibly low. Oh, it would just made two major, almost cross country moves. I didn't have a local network of any sort. And I decided to go cross country just to visit some friends. Mm -hmm. And when I was on the West Coast in San Francisco, I rented a white Mustang convertible and went up to wine country. Now this was back around 1990 or so. So wine okay. country was, wasn't as glitzy as it is today. It was a lot more down to earth, a lot more grounded. Anyway, I went driving and I ended up in Calistoga, which was not very ritzy back then. And in Calistoga, there was, it's no longer there, but there was an airport that actually intersected the main street right through town. Okay. <laughs> so I thought that's kind of interesting. And I went down and they were giving glider rides. So I went for a ride. It was neat. Didn't wow me that much. I went on about my way. Mm. When I got back to the East Coast where I was living, I heard about three uh, pilots who were flying gliders on the weekend. I invited myself out over a three-day weekend, flew for three yeah. days, and I was totally hooked, totally hooked. Now, the reason, and, and that in turn led to my moving into high-performance planes, taking my plane cross-country, and a number of other things. But the reason I tell that story is, in this context, I had these very random data points, if you will. I had this ride that I took, you know, I'd gone traveling. Um, I was trying to figure out my life. I had the courage to call and get involved in something. <clears throat> yeah. And without knowing what I was getting into, I had no idea at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that curiosity and that ability to gather a lot of random data points really coalesced for me and gave me direction when I really needed it. And it was a very difficult part of my life. I, I often call it my life wish, death wish part of my life mm. because my life on the ground was horrible. It was so horrible. I can't begin to tell you, but yeah. I had this alternate life in the air that was full of amazement and wonder and beauty and ability, which I really needed at that point in my life. So I, I tell that story in this context simply because get out there, do something different, get out of your comfort zone, be curious, be curious, be curious. It will take you interesting places. Okay. I like that. That's, that's literally the same overarching theme of my previous podcast. Uh, and that's what the lady said in the previous podcast as, as well. Shout out to Asha. Um, she said, curiosity, curiosity, stay, stay curious. And uh, did, did you know that you, you, that you would ever, well, I guess you kind of, answered it already, but that you, you would ever pursue anything that closely resembles being a pilot? No, no, not at all. <laughs> I mean, I've been flying since I was about six months old on commercial aircraft. And yeah. some of my father's friends had private planes and things, but it never just never occurred to me. I went to business school, you know, and then that that was the path I thought I would take. What happened with flying was just so I don't want to say random, but it was random. I, I took mm. a chance. I did something different and it really clicked with me. And it has, it was a, it's been a major part of my life for almost 15 years. I'm not flying yeah. right now. Um, and it, it opened my life to amazing adventures. Okay. Did you get your PPL? I'm sorry. Did you get your uh, private pilot's license? Yeah. I have a private pilot license, sailplane rating. Oh, okay. Nice. Nice. IFR? No. Okay. 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 I am a new PPL uh, uh -huh. pilot here. Uh, I got mine August of this past year. So actually yesterday I went for uh, my my currency. I hadn't flown in, in over 90 days, so like f four months, five months. So I went to, to, to do this three touch, touch and goes and full stop and did some stalls and whatnot just to get the bearing, bearings going again. So, so, but I, I, I asked the question about piloting because for me, since I was, you know, an ankle biter, I just, I've always wanted to, to fly. Like I remember I was in Mozambique just, uh, uh, probably seven, eight, maybe nine years, nine, nine, nine years old. I remember seeing a plane flying by. I was like, man, I just, what what's going on up there? Like I, I was just so curious about what 
what happens in the airplane, uh, let alone how, how, how to fly it. And I remember the first question that came to mind as the plane was flying overhead was, I should probably move out of the way because if somebody poops, you know, I don't wanna, I don't want it to, to, hit, to hit me in the head. Um, and and so this uh, this past summer, I, I decided, okay, hey, I gotta, I, I've wanted to to do this airplane thing. I, I don't know what what the future holds as far as pursuing it as a career or not. I that's beyond me. But I know that right now, I can I I, I can do it. I can learn how to fly. And so dove in and uh, became curious. Dove in, gave myself. I think it was like uh, uh, 38 days of actual, you know, inside of the cockpit actually flying, you know, before, before I, uh, I got my PPL, but um, curiosity. So now, yeah, no, huh. um, fly, powered flight in a small plane um, is practical, but it never, it never touched my soul. But something mm. touches my soul. I mean, you're looking at yeah. 15 to 20 meters of beautiful, long, white fiberglass wings, usually with a, a, a little um, winglet at the end. These things can go hundreds of miles without any source of obvious source of propel, of uh, you know, energy or anything. The energy's yeah. in the sky. And um, I mean, you can fly to 30,000 feet on a good day at Minden without too much trouble. Yeah, and you can run down mountain spines at 150 miles, Huh. 150 200 miles an hour. I mean, imagine running down a mountain spine like that. I used to look for the small, like 172s and 182s. Yeah. What I do is get a little altitude, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> a little, little speed and come down and just pull even with them and wave and then pull yeah. because it was all energy management and they totally yeah. freak yeah. out. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Huh. So, so uh, if we can stay on this curiosity thing, just, just a little bit here. Um, mm -hmm. There is, there is that saying that you know, curiosity killed the cat. Uh, and then there's the second half of that, of that sentence, which most people, most people just don't know, which is, but satisfaction brought it back, right? Um, so why is it that, that we're, we're so afraid to, even if, we, even if we're extremely curious about wanting to do something, right? What, what do you think is the biggest um obstacle that keeps people from stepping into the land of curiosity right so 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 there is a domain that, that that's calling their name but but there's so much unknown in that domain that it just they just want to stay that they want to be curious about it but to actually take the step is it's that there's something that keeps people from from doing so um how did you get over your well assuming that you had the fear the fear of the unknown right stepping into the into the unknown how, how did you get over that uh, the biggest fear I ever had was flying um, Whiskey Oscar, my plane. Those were her contest letters, Whiskey Oscar. Um, the first time, it was a high-performance plane, five, six flap settings, retractable gear. I'd never flown a sailplane like that. And it's a single-seat plane. So you get in and you have to do it. Huh. No one can teach you this. You just have to. And you have one shot to get it right, you know? Right, right. Um, that was immensely fearful. Uh, I, I felt like I was actually moving through almost like a science fiction um, passage, yeah. if you will. And I didn't know what would lie on the other side. And the, a sense of fear had been instilled in me by a pilot who was kind of a jerk, I realized in retrospect, but at the time it really shook me up. He said, you're mm. going to kill yourself in that plane. And okay. so I had this okay. voice saying, you're going to kill yourself in this plane. Um, I was the only woman on the field with a cool plane. All mm -hmm. the guys were like lying, you know, were sitting there waiting for me to fail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, it it was incredibly fearful. I just had to do it. And I think what really drove me, I was almost at a point where it would have been hard to back down. But most of all, I just found so much joy in the sky that I pushed through to do it. And I'm so grateful I did. Uh, but it was almost impossible. But one of my guests tells a great story. Eric Weinmayer, he um, went blind when he was 16. Okay, so you can imagine the anger and um, confusion, identity issues, everything that would go with an event like that. He yeah. went on to climb Everest, the Seven Summits, wow. yeah, wow. and to kayak the Colorado River Rapid. And he founded an organization called No Barriers USA, fantastic charity. 
that focuses mm -hmm. on helping people get through those sorts of humps. And wow. um, he tells a story, and I tell the story a lot, it's Eric's story, but I think it's so profound for all of us. He divides the world into three groups, and we've all been part of each of these groups, and these groups are fluid, we move between them. There are um, quitters who are self-evident, and we've all quit on occasion. The vast majority of people are campers. They want the mm -hmm. status quo no matter what. And in all fairness to them, they may have been so beat up by life that they don't want to put their head outside the foxhole. They just want to stay on their comfortable, narrow path. And the yeah. very few people are climbers. And I am fascinated by what it takes to go from being a camper to a climber because the vast majority of people will never make that leap. And they're failing right. to live a really authentic life as a result. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So, so that, that, that gives me like a small segue here of, of, of resentment, right? So, so if, if you are the camping type, right, uh, you are filled with, with curiosity yet you, you never allow yourself, you never invite yourself towards this adventure, right? Let, let's, let's call it adventure. Uh, and then you find yourself years down the road, growing ever, ever more resentful towards those that decided to climb. Maybe, maybe not. Um, maybe huh. you like, maybe you like comfort. Um, okay. I, I was talking to my dentist once and he was like, well, we need steady people in the world. <laughs> he mm -hmm. likes waking up and going to his dental practice and going home in the evening. And that is, yeah. that's his good life. And there's nothing good or bad about that. It just, that's his good life that I would kill myself if I had to live that life. I mean, it would just be too boring. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Huh. Mm. So I, I think different people have different um, degrees of comfort with discomfort. Okay. I think yep. getting yep. out of your comfort zone is the key to having a more adventuresome life. But yep. I think that that's just too uncomfortable for many people. Okay. Okay. So, so that's a hundred percent right. I, I totally, I totally get that. But at the same time, I'm trying to, I see resentment as, as, as a virus that, that, I suppose we all catch it at one point or another. Uh, but it's, it's one of those that that's one of those things that gets you, but only kills you in, in I don't know, 15, 20, 30 years. If, if you don't, if you don't guard your heart against it. So, so if, if you have people that if you have someone, let's say you're trying to attain a goal, right. And for one reason or another, you, you give up on that goal. Um, let's not go into the reasons let's not let's not make up you know reasons here but let's say you, for one reason or another you don't attain that goal and someone else does and you find yourself and this is an assumption that i'm making here but you find yourself growing more growing resentful either towards them or towards yourself for not having done you know not having uh tried harder or or, or tried again um how how do you guard your heart from from growing resentful from being resentful that's 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 the way to put it I think that is um, a choice you make in your own mind. Um, I, I'm very big on meditation. It's really changed my life. And mm -hmm. one of the benefits of meditation is it allows you to um, actually witness your own thoughts. So once you can witness okay. your thoughts, now you have the power of choice. You didn't have choice before because you were just on autopilot. So what do you choose? Do you choose to be resentful? Do you choose to look back and say, that's interesting, that wasn't my path? Do you choose to say, maybe I should retry that? I, I think you have a lot of choice. But I think, again, going back to the comfort zone discussion, um, a lot of people just have a, lo a constant stream of, of thought and conversation in their mind. And it's very unconscious and it dominates everything. It doesn't give them the space to think or reflect. And most of is, all, it, to think or reflect about yourself, because that's where the ultimate wisdom lies for you and your life is within you. Great. So just for, for clarification here, is uh, reflection and meditation the same? Are they interchangeable? Or, or is like all forms of meditations, all form of meditation is reflection, but not all reflection is meditation? No, I wouldn't say meditation is reflection at all. I would say meditation okay. is quiet and peace. Okay. 
and okay. in that mental peace, which is very different from what we are exposed to in the day-to-day -day world. You know, the TV is mm -hmm. going, people are talking, people are arguing, you have to get things done. But if you can create a, a, a place of peace, mm. that's mm. pretty cool. And the thing that's so interesting about meditation is it's experiential. You experience that peace. So you know it's real and you know it's there all the time. So as you go about your daily life, you can always find that peace. And that gives you a little more perspective on things because from a point of peace, you can watch things play out. Hmm. I like that. Um, random segue here. What is, uh, if you can remember, your earliest uh, favorite song, like as far back as you can think, what's, what's the song that like, as you were a youngling that you had on repeat? Oh, gosh. Probably something from Abbey Road. Um, Here Comes the Sun. That was on Abbey Road, I think. Okay, here comes the sun. Huh. How old did you say you were? Oh, I know I got that album, I think. I, this this isn't super young, but I think I was in eighth grade when I got that album for Christmas. Okay, well, and so before that, you can't, there's no music? Like, 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 as far as you can... No, see, I'm not that musically oriented. I mean, I okay. actually prefer peace and quiet yeah. huh. to a lot of sound. You know, so... To each his own in that regard. Yeah, yeah. But and sound, interestingly, can be a wonderful entree to meditation. Right, right. What about now? Do you do you have, uh, what, what would you say are like your top two, top three songs, if you listen to music? Uh, Louis Armstrong. Um, oh, what's his famous song? Roses are red, violets are, no. Oh, um, mm. oh, what is the name of the song? It'll come to me. Okay. Um, what else? Oh, uh, it's a classical piece. And actually the Smithsonian played it um, while a, a sailplane was roaring down the Appalachian Ridge. And the name, oh. the name will come to me. It's a very famous piece. You would have, you would know it. I'm never prepared for musical questions. I need to prepare for these. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. So, well, this is, speaking of gliders and airplanes and music, do you listen to music when, when you're flying? Oh, no, because you have, um, no, you have, um, you have audio um, instruments, like you have an audio variometer and things like that. And you want to be able to hear that. There's the radio. Yeah. You can turn it all off, which is really fun, but you have to be pretty aware of your surroundings. Right, right. Right. Okay. Okay. I thought maybe you either have some soothing music or just everything off. You just hear the the air uh, f you flowing could. over the the, uh, the airframe there. So, huh. actually, it's so they're so quiet. You really just don't hear much of anything. Yeah. Yeah. So so earlier on, you you mentioned. Uh, oh, I totally forgot the the, the country. You said Zambia, Tanzania. Uh, uh, Tanzania. Uh, Tanzania. Okay. Okay. Oh. Uh, what other countries have you frequent? Have you visited? Oh gosh, I can't even count them all. All over Europe, parts of South America, you know. Yeah. Um, but ta Tanzania was really spectacular. I went with uh, a Nikon ambassador. It was a photo um, trip initially, and yeah. three professional photographers and me. I learned mm. so much. It was just a fantastic learning experience. Wow. Do you, do you speak another language? I used to speak French semi-fluently, but these days, no. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah, languages, they kind of... I've learned and forgotten about six of them. So if you don't <laughs> use them, they really they really, <laughs> they really disappear. So, um, huh. Well, so um, let, let, let's talk a little, a, little, a little bit more. Maybe we kind of like forgotten this. Um, not forgotten, but like I, I skipped over it a little bit. Um, you have a podcast, right? And you've... Mm -hmm. You have many, many, many hours un under your belt speaking to people within the framework of a podcast, not just, you know, family and friends, of course. Um, and, and so so one of the questions that I typically try to get out of people or one of the understandings is you have a certain set of advices, a certain set of lessons that you've learned, and 
let's just assume here that you've shared some of those with, with, with other people. Now, some people have taken those advices, implemented into, into, into their lives and seen something that closely resembles a, a good result, right? Let's at the very least, but yet others, um, they receive the same advice and they don't implement. It doesn't, doesn't mean that they're incapable of, it doesn't mean that they're incompetent of doing so. Uh, it's just some people don't. So, so in, in, Having had such, you've had, you've had your, your podcast for, for four years, you said, right? Mm -hmm. So the question that, that I have here is like, what, what do you see being the biggest barrier, right? Between um, like once, like people having a conceptual understanding of, of a concept a, or of, of, uh, of an advice, right? And the implementation of that advice, right? There's typically a long, a long distance there just because you understand something and you want something. Um, somehow for some people there it's still it's still a long road to actually implementing that that advice so if someone is listening to, to this podcast and they find one of these advices useful um but the road to, to to implementing that advice can be long depending on what you know what it is that, that, that they're dealing with how how do you encourage someone to break down the task break down the goal that they have right and and so that they take the smallest possible step that they can towards that goal without giving up actually on my podcast i don't give advice i tell stories mm. and okay. it's all about the story of my guest now on my podcast my role is to be the host and get their story out but mm -hmm. i also do a five minute podcast called side trips and they're all under the bump in the road brand and everything. But side trips, let me say what I talk about, whatever I want to talk about. Because often there's so many interesting things that come up in a discussion with a guest that um, off to the side, I, I want to have some commentary. Like when I interviewed Jill Bolta Taylor, she um, did the famous TED talk, uh, My Stroke of Insight. We mm -hmm. talked about her new book and the methodologies in her book. And I applied them to a situation I was facing. And so I did that as a side trip to kind of as a connection between what I was going through and what I experienced and learned and her story. Okay. Okay. So focusing, focusing on stories. Why stories? Is it because they're more relatable? Is it because they, they're more tangible? Um, stories touch our hearts. And it's that heartfelt emotion that will eventually leave an impact on you and move you. You can, it's, you can read, take, take chocolate, for example. Well, that's, that's, that's more of my meditation example. If you, you could read, you can read about something. Okay. But yeah. that may not really be what motivates you. But if you hear a story with emotion, if you hear a story about how somebody navigated a bump in the road, you, mm -hmm. there will be something in your life that connects with that. And that heartfelt connection is what has the possibility of changing your selections in your life. It's not knowledge. It's not intellectual knowledge. It's what you feel. It's emotion. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to honor the, the, uh, the hour here that, that we're coming to, to the close to. Um, and, and so are there any, any final thoughts that, that you would like to leave the audience, the audience with, uh, as far as, uh, curiosity and um uh, some of the some of the wisdoms that you've collected over the years um staying curious yourself take a chance get out of your comfort zone you might be amazed at what you discover not only in the world but about yourself not only in the world but about yourself pat Whistle, thank you so much for coming to the moses cabanana podcast it's been a pleasure having you here Thank you. This is great. Thank you very much.